From the dawn of time we came, moving silently down through the centuries, living many secret lives, struggling to reach the time of the gathering, when the few who remain will battle to the last. No one has ever known we were among you, until now. Back in the 1920s, the Iraqi Stargate was uncovered in Baghdad. This Stargate was surrounded by the Green Zone during the Iraqi War. This was a repeat of when Hitler and Nazi Germany went to Iraq to fight against the British as both wanted control of the Iraqi Stargate. Representatives of Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy attempted to gain favour with various Iraqi nationalists and promised support against the British. On the 2nd of May 1941, after tensions mounted on both sides, the British launched a preemptive land strike against the Iraqi forces and the Anglo-Iraq war began. There were many reports of underground bases reported all over the world. This is an alleged KGB map of alien bases on Earth. There is an entrance to the tunnels in New York City, in the vicinity of Midtown Manhattan, that can be reached through an abandoned elevator shaft that only very few know about. The Nahani Valley, Canada, this covers 250 square miles in the southern end of the Mackenzie Mountains of Canada. It lies almost 550 miles due west of Fort Simpson on the Mackenzie River of Northwest Canada. This valley is inhabited only by animals, as people entering the valley are usually found headless. The Indian tribes of the area avoid this valley, often referred to as the Valley of Headless Men. The Leobar Cave entrance, this was sealed off by Catholic priests who believed that it to be the entrance to hell. The village of Leoba, or to translate, the cavern of death, was located in the province of Zapteke, somewhere near the ancient village of Michelin, or the village of the underworld. The Arizona Tunnels and Caves Hopi legends say that their ancestors once lived underground with a friendly race of ant people but some of their kind turned to sorcerer and made an alliance with lizard or serpent men, known as two hearts, which dwell in still deeper caverns below. The flood of evil and violence forced the peaceful Hopi to the surface. An explorer named G.E. Kincard claimed to have found one of the ancient caves in which were reportedly discovered Oriental Egyptian and Central American type artifacts. Smithsonian archaeologist S. A. Jordan and associates were ex also explored the man-made cavern with hundreds of rooms, enough to hold 50,000 people. The underground city is about 42 miles upriver from El Torvar Crystal Canyon and the Crystal Creek and about 2,000 feet above the riverbed on the east wall. South America Carl Brueger, in his book The Chronicles of Akar, gives the history as given to the author by one of the chiefs of the Ugar Mongolo tribes, whose ancestors were allegedly part of a vast empire which covered South America in ancient times. Some of these ancient people, the chief claimed, left the planet in aerial vessels to explore other planets of the solar system and beyond, leaving behind vast subterranean cities beneath the Andes Mountains and western Brazil. In 1971, due to the constant encroachment of settlers or invaders into their territories, 
30,000 survivors of the Ugala Mongola tribe allegedly escaped to this ancient system of underground cities consisting of 13 separate subterranean complexes all connected by tunnels one of which is said to extend to Lima and others of which are located throughout the Andes mountain range of Peru. There is an ancient legend among the Hindus of India that tells of a civilization of immense beauty beneath Central Asia. Several underground cities are said to be located north of the Himalayan mountains, possibly in Afghanistan or under the Hindu Kush. This subterranean Shangri-La inhabited by a race of golden people who seldom communicate with the surface world. From time to time they travel into our land through tunnels that stretch in many directions. Entrances to these tunnels are believed to be hidden in several of the ancient cities of the Orient. Tunnel entrances are said to be in Alora and the Ajanta caverns in, in the Chandor mountain range of India. The company is essentially a, a cybernetic collective of people and machines. That's what a company is. And then there are different, there's different levels of complexity in the way these companies are formed. And then there are sort of, there's this sort of like a collective AI in, in the Google sort of search, Google search, you know, the, where we're all sort of plugged in as like, like nodes on the network, like leaves on a big tree. All f and we're all, we're all feeding this network without questions and answers. We're all collectively programming the AI. And, the, the, and Google plus the, all the humans that connect to it are one giant cybernetic collective. This is also true of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these social networks. They're giant cybernetic collectives. They're Humans all, and electronics all interfacing and constantly now, constantly connected. Yes, constantly. When I watch you doing all these things, I'm like, how does this motherfucker have all this time and all this energy and all these ideas and then people just let him do these things? Because I'm an alien. That's what I've speculated. Yes. I, th I'm on record saying this in the past. I wonder. It's true. I mean, if there was one, I was like, if there was like maybe an intelligent being that we created, you know, like some AI creature yeah. that's uh, superior to people, maybe would just hang around with us for a little while like you've been doing and then fix a bunch of shit. Maybe that's the way. Boreas is the name of the Greek god of the north wind in Greek mythology. So the term Hyperborea is the land located far beyond in north. The Hyperboreans are mentioned in the Greek myths before the time of Homer. Herodotus mentions them as a being part of the legendary Theban epic of the Egyptian myth, but in some way connected with the cult of Apollo, the sun god whose homeland is said to be beyond the north wind, possibly in the region of the Arctic Circle. The Hyperboreans, according to the same source, were alleged to live for a thousand years, but they had a tradition that any who tired of such a long life could end it in a ritual suicide ceremony, whereby the person involved was decked with floral garlands and allowed to jump off a high pinnacle into the sea. Other legends think of Iboria as a legend of the west, identifying it with the garden of Hesperides, whose tree bore golden fruits. The Elysian fields or even the Happy Isles. The general idea was that this was an island of paradise lying somewhere between the Azores and Iceland which, like Atlantis, sank beneath the waves after some great catastrophe. Some scholars directly connect the two and claim that Hyperborea was in fact the last continent of Atlantis. Jerry Foster thinks that Hyperborea and Thule could refer to the same place, 
and depending on how far back in time the legends can be traced. It may be inferred that there was a warm, temperate and habitable land in the North Pole before the last polar shift. He even says that the legendary land could well be the British Isles, merged with the European landmass at that time, which are far northwest of both Egypt and Greece. Alternatively, Foster suggests that the Thule could be Iceland and Ultima Thule could be Greenland, because according to Pythias, a famous Greek navigator of the 4th century BCE, Thule was a six day voyage north of Britain, though whether by sail or oar power isn't stated. There is also a possibility that both were united into the Hyperborean continent. Deva means heavenly, divine or anything of excellence and is one of the terms for a deity in Hinduism. In the earliest Vedic literature, all supernatural beings are called Devas and Azuras. The concepts and legends evolve in ancient Indian literature and by the late Verdict period, benevolent supernatural beings are referred to as Devas Azuras. In post-Verdict text, the Devas represent the good and the Azuras the bad. The leader of the Devas is Shiva. Devas and Azuras in the Vedic law are similar to the Olympian gods and titans of Greek mythology. Both are powerful but have different orientations, with the Devas representing the power of light and the Azuras representing the power of darkness in the Hindu mythology. The oldest texts mention Devas and their struggle with the Azuras. For example, in Book 4 states that Indra was weaker than the Azuras when he did not know his own soul, self. Once Indra had self-knowledge, he became independent, sovereign and victorious over the Azuras. The man who knows his inner self gains independence, sovereignty and is unaffected by all evil. The 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita states that, that pure godlike saints are rare and pure demon-like evil are rare among human beings. And the bulk of humanity is multi-charactered with a few or many faults. The Gita states that desire, aversion, greed, needs, emotions in various forms are facts of ordinary lives and it is only when they turn to lust, hate, cravings, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, hypocrisy, violence, cruelty and such negativity and destruction inclined that natural human inclinations metamorphose into something demonic, meaning the Azora. Everyone starts as an Azora in Hindu mythology Born with the same father, Azuras who remain Azura share the character of powerful beings, obsessed with their cravings for more power, more wealth, ego, anger, unprincipled nature, force and violence. The Azuras who became Divas, in contrast, are driven by an inner voice, seek understanding and meaning, prefer moderation, principled behaviour, morals, knowledge and harmony. Azuras are sometimes considered nature spirits, they battle constantly with the Devas. Azuras are described in Indian texts as powerful superhuman demigods with good or bad qualities. 
The Azoras are evil spirits, demons and opponents of the gods. Azoras control the chaos, creating evil in Hindu and Persian, well collective Aryan mythology about the battle between good and evil. Some scholars suggest that the word Azura may be related to the Proto-Norse history. The Azir Azura correspondence is the relation between Azura of Verdic Sanskrit to Azir of Old Norse word. Azir of which the meaning is Lord, Powerful, Spirit, God. The correspondence extends beyond Azur and extends to a host of parallels such as Imra, Indra, Sampas, Stamba and many other elements of respective mythologies. Today we're going to talk about what I think the Pleiadians religion was. I think the Paulicans and the Pleiadians have a very close connection and I'm going to show you in this video how they connect all the way up to the Protestant Reformation. The Paulicans were a Christian sect that flourished between 650 and 872 in Armenia. According to medieval Byzantine sources, the group's name was derived from a 3rd century bishop of Antioch. The sources show that most Paulican leaders were Armenians. The founder of the sect is said to have been an Armenian by the name of Constantine. He studied the Gospels and combined dualistic and Christian doctrines, vigorously opposed the formation of the church. Regarding himself as having been called to restore the pure Christian, he adopted the name Silvanus and about 660 he founded his first congregation in Armenia. 27 years later he was arrested by the imperial authorities, tried for heresy and stoned to death. Constantine's successor was burned to death in 1690. The adherents of this sect fled, with Paul at their head. He died in 715, leaving two sons. His successor's death in 745 was the occasion of a division in the sect, Zacharias and Joseph being the leaders of the two parties. The latter had the larger following and was succeeded by the Bainis in 775. The sect grew in spite of persecution. The Paulicans were now divided into Bainites and the Sergites. At the same time the Sergites fought against their rivals and nearly executed them. Bains was supplanted by Sergius. In 801, the control of the sect was divided between several leaders. The Empress Theodora, as regent to her son Michael III, instituted the persecution against the Paulicans throughout Asia Minor, in which 100,000 Paulicans in Byzantine, Armenia, are said to have lost their lives and all of their property and lands were confiscated by the Empire. In 871, the Emperor Basil I ended the power of the state of the Paulicans, and the survivors fled to the east of the Byzantine Arab border. In 970, 200,000 Paulicans were transferred by the Emperor from Armenia to Thrace as a reward for their promise to keep back the Scythians. The Emperor granted them religious freedom. This was the beginning of the revival of the sect. Several thousand went into the army. When the Crusaders took Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade, 1204, they found some Paulicans, whom the historian Godfried calls Popelicans. According to the historian Jordan Ivanov, 
some of the Paulicans were converted to Orthodoxy and Islam, and the rest to the Catholic faith during the 16th and 17th century. At the end of the 17th century, the Paulicans people still living around Nicopol, Bulgaria, and persecuted by the Ottoman Empire after the uprising in 1688, and a good part of them fled across the Danube and settled in the Banat region. There are still over 10,000 Banat Bulgarians in Romania today, with a few in Arad. However, they no longer practice their religion since they converted to Roman Catholicism. Their folklore is specific about Bulgaria's liberation from the Ottoman rule in 1878. A number of Banat Bulgarians resettled in the northern part of Bulgaria and still reside there today. In Russia, after the war of 1828-29, to Paulican communities could still be found in the part of Armenia occupied by the Russians. Documents of their professions of faith, Connie Bear based his depiction of the Paulicans as simple, godly folk who had kept an earlier form of Christianity. The Paulicans accepted many parts of Christianity. They believed that Christ came down from heaven to emancipate humans from the body and from the world. The reverence from the cross they look upon as heathenish. Their places of worship they called places of prayer. They also practiced marriage. People regard the Paulicans as the forerunners of the Cathars. The Paulicans were branded as Jews, Mohammedans, Arians, Manicheans. It is likely that their opponents called them these terms of abuse. They call themselves Christians or true believers. Some people accuse the Cathars of Arianism. Some scholars see Cathar Christology as having traces of earlier Arian roots. According to some of their contemporary enemies, did not accept the normal understanding of Jesus but consider him the human form of an angel. Some people compare the Cathars to Western Buddhists because their view of the doctrine of resurrection taught by Jesus was in fact similar to the Buddhist doctrine of reincarnation. The Cathars taught that to regain angelic status one had to renounce the material self completely until one was prepared to do so, he or she would be stuck in a cycle of reincarnation, condemned to live on a corrupt earth. Killing was also abhorrent, but to the Cathars, they sustained from all animal food, sometimes eating fish. They avoided anything considered to be a byproduct of sexual reproduction. War and capital punishment were also condemned. In a world where few could read, their rejection of oath-taking marked them as social outcasts. Catharism has been seen as giving women the greatest opportunities for independent action since women were found to be believers as well as perfecti. Cathars believed that one could be repeatedly reincarnated until one commits to the self-denial of the material world. A man could be reincarnated as a woman and vice versa, thereby rendering gender meaningless. The spirit was the utmost importance to the Cathars, immaterial and sexless. Because of this belief, the Cathars saw women as equally capable of being spiritual leaders, which undermined the very concept of gender as held by the Catholic Church. Women accused of being heretics in early medieval Christianity included those labelled Gnostics, Cathars, as well as several other groups that were sometimes tortured and executed. Cathars, like Gnostics, who preceded them, assigned more importance to the role of Mary Mandeline in the spread of early Christianity than the Church previously did. Her vital role as a teacher 
contributed to the Cathar belief that women could serve as spiritual leaders. Women were found to be included in the perfecti in significant numbers. The Cathars saw Mary Mandolin as perhaps even more important than St. Peter, the founder of the church. The Cathar movement proved successful in gaining female followers because of its proto-feminist teaching, along with the general feeling of exclusion from the Catholic Church. Catharicism attracted numerous women with the promise of a leadership role that the Catholic Church did not allow. They let women become a perfect of the faith, a position of far more prestige than anything the Catholic Church offered. The publication of the early scholarship book Crusade Against the Grail by the young German Otto Rahn rekindled interest in the connection between the Cathars and the Holy Grail, especially in Germany. The philosopher and Nazi government official Alfred Rosenberg speaks favourably of the Cathars in the myth of the 20th century. Starting in the 1990s and continuing to the present day, historians like R. I. Moore have radically challenged the extent of which Catharicism as an institutionalised religion actually existed, building on the works of French historians such as Monique Zenner and Uri Broom. Moore's The War on Heresy argues that Catharicism was contrived from the resources of the well-stocked imaginations. In short, Moore claims the men and women persecuted as Cathars were not the followers of a secret religion imported from the East. Instead, they were part of a broader spiritual revival taking place in the, in the later 12th and early 13th century. There is widespread belief that the Knights Templar and the Cathars had similar worldview. What is undeniable is that they shared the fate of being denounced as heretics and violently attacked by, by secular authorities of France. They were subject to arrest, interrogation and torture by the Inquisition, and in some cases executed by burning at the stake. Some have claimed, because of some shared Gnostic heritage, the Order of the Temple offered shelter to fugitive Carthers during the papal persecution of the sect which commenced a century before the Templars themselves faced destruction. The Templars in the meantime are supposed to have embraced many Cathar doctrines. The two heretical groups are supposed to have been united additionally by reverence of a particular female saint, Mary Mandolin, and by having some special insight concerning her relationship with Jesus. The Templars were founded to defend pilgrims in territory taken by the First Crusade and were based on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Their primary backer, a Sistine Abbot, secured their recognition as an arm of the Church at the Council of Troyes. He also saw that these warriors, living celebrately and without personal property, the Templars grew quickly. Another religious movement, known to history as the Cathar Heresy, was taking root in southern France at this time. The Cathars were similar to the Templars in their scorn of worldly things and their obsession with chastity. Pope Innocent III ordered the persecution of the Cathars. The ingrained corruption of heresy does not cease to breed monstrous offspring. Let us enforce correction on these vile breed of people. This campaign became known as the Albigen Crusade, after the town of Albi, one of those hotbeds of Catharicism.
It must have been difficult as this turned out to be total war. A rash sortie of the defenders left the gate of the city undefended and the rabble of the northern army was able to surge through and hold it open. As the streets filled with blood, many of the people fled to a church in the upper town which was dedicated to Mary Mandolin. The crusaders trapped them there and slaughtered them. In one morning, the town was wiped out. Altogether, some 20,000 people, regardless of age and sex. Arnold Armory marked Mary Mandolin's day with the first mass burning of living Cathars. There may have been genuine fears that as the Templars had operated at the same time as the rise of Catharicism, that they had imbibed some of their philosophy, or that the Templars were influenced by ancient Christian beliefs in the East that were very similar to those held by French heretics. Worse, there may have been an underlying fear that the Templar military might could be used to carve out a Cathar sympathetic state in southern France, as the crusades in the Holy Land crumbled, where might the Templar energy and know-how be expanded? But their ideas persisted. Many agreed with their view that the Church should return to traditions of poverty and piety. Their questioning of the Catholic view that the bread in the mass literally becomes the body of Christ continued to be discussed in low whispers before erupting to the surface centuries later in the Protestant Reformation. Many of France's elite had family connecting to the Cathars. It seemed that in spite of the success of Innocent's Crusade, Catharicism still lurked in the dark corners of French society. As you can see the Calvinism symbol, very similar to the Templar symbol, also the Cathar symbol and the Church of England symbol. So this is, in my view, these, this is where it's spread to. I hope you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and make sure to subscribe, thank you very much.
Thank you.